All right, welcome everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so for all of you who don't know, my name is Benny. I will introduce myself again a little bit later. But first I want to tell you a story. So the story goes back uh, now, like this story goes back 13 years. And it all started with an exception. So back in the day, I was working, uh, let me think, I was actually studying at that time, and I was working at a little software shop called Eclipsource. Uh, for those who like, was w were working around here, there's actually a booth, they, they still exist, they're still doing great. Um, I was working there at the time and was doing a, work for, a sh workshop for customers. So I trained them on RCP things and how to do RAP, which is something we built back in the days. And one of our, like one of the, one of the people there, they actually encountered an exception, a null pointer exception. And they were like, hey Benny, I don't know what this is, what's the problem here? I, I need help. I was like, okay, click on it and see what, like why is that failing with a null value? And he was like, yeah, I can't click that. Why not? That's not my code. And so we established that over here, that's his code. He can click that, but the other stuff, that's framework, that's platform, that's Eclipse. I can't click into that. I, don't, I can't deal with framework code. And so that was the moment when this talk was born. I realized that the way I interacted with source code was a little bit different than the way he interacted with source code. And I, like over the last couple of years, I tried to figure out what the difference is and uh, how I can actually maybe help others to see it the same way. So my name is Benny, I'm working for GitHub nowadays, uh, working on the Copilot extension in, at GitHub, for those who might know that. Uh, I'm a Java champion and I'm working a lot on, on open source software, both in my day-to-day -day job and also in my free time. And I, tr like I asked myself, how did that happen? How did I get into open source? Why did I get into open source? And also, um, how, did, how did that help me? So there are essentially four pillars of open source that I found very relevant for me. One part is learning and fun. That was actually the motivation initially to get into that. The other is creating new opportunities. Without open source, I wouldn't have the job I have, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't actually stand here. Uh, we will get back to how Eclipse can play the role in all, all of that. Um, it can actually help your company. I'm pretty sure every one of you consumes open source the one or other way, especially with Eclipse. And it also helps your career because you can find opportunities along the way and meet people who might help you to move forward. And I would actually highlight a, a few of those people today as well. So there are two basic ways you can go about open source software. Over there, it's you. You start on the left. And you can, you can actually go and contribute to an existing project, which is nice because there is a paved path there's like a street already built. Uh, it also limits you in your abilities and what you can do. Uh, so there is a street, there are already houses, and so it's, it's pretty much set for you. But you can also like go off and, and create your own adventure. Uh, it's a lot harder. I've done it myself. It's a, a lot, lot harder, but it's also a lot more fun uh, going through the mountains there. So let's see what I learned from doing that. So my, my first own open source project was back in the days with PHP there was this super cool thing called ExistDB, which was an XML database. I actually looked it up. No SQL was coined, but nobody knew about that thing. Um, and I didn't need any of this. I didn't even have a job, but I thought, what not, why not? Let's write some libraries to connect to that XML database because that sounds fun. Why not? And back in the days, publishing a package at PHP, at PHP was um, submitting it to Peer, which was their repository, or like their package repository. And the thing is, you had to get voted in. So there was a committee of people voting on your package, whether it's good enough to be part of the whole, their package manager. And the fun thing is, um, I did that. It took me almost a year to build that. I was young and I had to learn a lot. And finally, I got accepted. Yay, I had six plus ones. And it was a huge success. It had four downloads. You're laughing. It was really a huge success for me because that was the point I learned 
how to write up a technical proposal, how to properly document APIs. I got in touch with PHP experts in the field who reviewed my code, gave me feedback. Le I learned from them how to do those things. And that was pretty cool. I was really, really happy with that. So number one key takeaway is success is defined by what you learn from it. Open source can provide an actually a great environment to learn because there are other people way smarter than me and you who can, you can learn from. And also it's not about smarts, it's also they know a lot of other things you might not know yet. And so one of those, one of those persons um, is Alex. So if you, people here at EclipseCon might recognize her. So Alex, um, she used to be a tester at Bradex, she's now the CEO there. And over the last years, she also had a lot of contact with the open source community. And for her, one of the biggest things in open source that contributed to her career as like a CEO and keynote speaker these days is the value that the community brings together. Like there are so many people with different, different thoughts and different aspects, and they all come together to build that one thing. And I think at Eclipse, um, you see that pretty well. So let's talk about my first contribution to a large project. That was Eclipse. I used ba Eclipse back in the days when it was a Java IDE. I used it for PHP because people said, Benny, you have to use an IDE. I'm like, okay. Um, it took me a few days until I filed my first bug report because things didn't work out the way I wanted to be. And that was 16 years ago. It got resolved as invalid by Susan. Susan here today? Oh, okay. Um, thing is, it felt weird, but at the same time it was great because I interacted with two committers on the project. They both explained to me in great detail why am I thinking is wrong, what I should do instead. It was not a bug, I was just holding it wrong. Over the years, uh, I filed a few more bugs. Um, I think I never hit the thousand. Need to do that. Uh, but the interesting thing is, if I just so looking back, just looking at the four, the first four bugs I reported at Eclipse. Let's take a look at number two. Something with tooltips not working in the Eclipse Milan project. I interacted with someone called Robert Elves, someone called Mick Kirsten and Stefan Pingle. Turns out, there's a startup that grew into a large company. I was actually working there for 10 years remotely as one of the first only remote engineers. Because by working together on that open source project, we had to trust to work across continents and across time zones together on the same thing. And those interactions on, on the bug tracker actually helped me to establish that relationship and that work relationship with those other people. Uh, so this is Stefan. He's nowadays a principal engineer at Tahastop. And for him, it was the same, like to work on the Eclipse Smiling Project, that was an amazing experience. I learned a ton during the time. Uh, he met all the people, and this is also where he's working since um, like now 13 years. And this is how we, we met on bug trackers. So lesson number two I learned during the years is contributions are more than code. Learn from the interactions with the community. I have filed so many bugs and I had found so many discussions, I learned so many things during that time. Uh, so for example, in university I actually hated compilers. As part of working and contributing to the Eclipse JDT project, I actually learned to love them. And nowadays it's actually part of my day job to, to interact with compilers. So that, that was a pretty awesome learning experience. My first code contribution to a large project. It was number four. It took four bucks until I had enough. I have to fix this myself. Bear with me, I was a PHP developer. We all know Eclipse is not written in PHP. And to quote Alan here, uh, to, <laughs> today I learned that the following is the immutable law. The hardest part of any first time contribution to an open source project is figuring out how to run its built in tests. Back then, no Maven, no Gradle. That was PDE build. Who remembers PDE build? We should have a beer together today. <laughs> it took me, I think, a week or so to, have to set that thing up. And then I made, I made my first change. 
it was pretty awful. I didn't know Java, so I actually had to Google index off back then. Um, also, the operators could be short circuit, but eh, what gives? The thing is, it got accepted. I got my first open source patch contributed, and in that process, contributing to that patch, I met other people. I met Vasim, I met Chris, and Chris is nowadays uh, the CTO of the CNCF. So he did open source all the way. And uh, I actually talked to him to, as part of this talk. I actually interviewed those people again to reflect on their open source contributions and their times in open source. And for him, it was the same. Like Eclipse was one of the biggest impact things in his life, given the community, given the interactions we, he had, given co the connections he made throughout the world. And that all because open source developers work together. And that, that was also one thing that I, that I saw. Work on the things that interest you. Uh, your own tool chain is a good start. Eclipse was my own tool chain. I was usually working on stuff that interested me that I wanted to, to use myself every day. Like that first patch that I wrote, I used that almost every day as part of my workflow for the next 10 years. And over here, EGIT, I never wanted to touch EGIT as a project. I didn't have to have capacity or time, but I wanted to use Git and I wanted to use Eclipse. And so I had to start with your own tool chain. So you're all thinking the same. Like Benny, I got better things to do in my evenings than starting to hack on EGIT and Eclipse and whatnot. Um, I feel you, I hear you, I have two boys at home. I don't, I don't work as much on open source as I used to. But there are, other, there are other parts how to do that. Um, I think a lot of you are aware of that as part of your day-to-day -day job, to create awareness that your products depend on open source and that it actually is beneficial for your company and for your own development to contribute to them. Because you learn something, you can actually pull more knowledge into your company, into your teams uh, by doing that. And sometimes it also creates less work. Uh, so this one is an example. I remember, I think it was from the Hastop, um, where over the years, more and more teams worked around a, sp a specific issue until someone looked a little bit deeper what the issue was, did a one-line fix with seven lines of test code to remove the 6,000-line workaround. And sometimes it's, it's easier to click on that first frame in the stack trace and actually figure out what the problem really is. And this is also what Mark experienced. Uh, Mark is a principal engineer at Gradle. He is also the JUnit 5 team lead. How did he get there? He had to fix a dependency resolution conflict with JUnit 4. He got that merged as a PR. There was no one around to build JUnit 4. So he took it on. He did the next release to unblock his own company. And over time, he actually um, got into the role of a JUnit 5 team lead, um, working on that part of the time at Gradle. And uh, that's also something that's a key lesson I learned over the years to make it visible what you do. Like not only do things in like as a secret, but be public about it, be public about the work you do. Uh, so others can benefit from it and you can benefit from it going forward. Gaining expert knowledge. Actually, let, let's pull this up here. Um, you're all aware of that dialogue. That dialogue, I cursed at that dialogue so many times because it didn't do the thing I wanted to do. It didn't remember certain things the way I wanted to do. So I dug in. I said, at one night, screw it, I will fix this. So I tried to find the source code for it, um, tried debugging it, tried to f like understand the complexities behind the dialogue because there's a lot more complexity than, like there's enough uh, complex in the UI, there's even more in the code base. But soon I realized there's code that actually is doing exactly what I want it to do. Why isn't it working? And then it hit me. There's a customize button. I haven't seen it. I've used Eclipse for years. <laughs> Never seen it. It's like, okay, stupid Benny. Let's move on. Showed it in a pair programming session to my colleague. He's, he was also quite enthusiastic Eclipse user. He had never seen it. We presented it in an Eclipse tips and tricks talk at our company. 
they bought us 40 beers for each person who didn't know that button. Who knows that button here? Who, who didn't know it before today? 20 people, please. Have fun with that search dialog again. Um, so gaining expert knowledge, sometimes it's just looking at the code of the things you use, not just use them, but actually look behind the scenes. And so this is another one. Computing the factorial. Recursively, you, you return if it's uh, less or, or equals than two, or you go n times factorial of n minus one. How could you solve that differently? A loop, yeah. Any other ideas? All right, I'll show you how Google does it in Guava. Why? So I asked the author, because that's the cool thing with open source, you can just ask people. So I pinged him, uh, he's one of the Google Java teams, and he explained it pretty easily, like these are all constants, they're folded at compile time. So this is actually a lookup once you get there at runtime. If you're a Google scale, that actually makes a difference. The good thing is you can stop at 20 because anything larger than that equals to lo like max long. It doesn't matter. And so this little trick actually gave them quite a lot of, um, of CPU back. So that's another thing I learned over the years. Don't hold back, just ask in maintainers. Join the different channels, be it IRC, be it Gitter, or whatever. And it also um, is what happened to David. David is a principal engineer at Heroku. I met him years ago in my PHP times when we both were the maintainers of the German Smart um forum, where we helped German users to use a specific framework. And it was fun because we met each other there, helping others. We worked together on different frameworks. And over the years, we actually worked together on other things that inspired more frameworks after that. And it's, it's great to see that some of those hacking sessions actually led to more things to be created over time. So just have to check my time here. Part of gaining expert knowledge is also easily get into another code base. Getting into a code base doesn't mean you have to understand every little thing in a code base. Getting into a code base means you have, can very quickly have a rough idea of the layout and go deep where you need to. Also finding like, ways how you can de go deep immediately without knowing the code at all. Like the search dialog in Eclipse, pick a string in the UI, search for the string in the whole code base, you will very likely find the right source files where the dialog lives. On GitHub, um, just press the dot key. It will just open up the whole project in a VS Code instance. Um, might not be in a state where you can really work with it, but for exploratory things, it's, it's actually awesome. And one thing I love to do, at least in good projects, go in there, check it out, <laughs> change something that you think is stupid or doesn't work, and run the tests and see what happens. That's something I, I regularly use. I just change something, or I do actually remove code and see which tests break. What was that, what's the intention of this code change? Only works if you have tests, though. And it reminds me of Vlad here. Um, he's the CEO at Hyper Persistence. Uh, you might have interacted with his articles and stuff if you're into database development in Java. And, uh, He's also like, he, he loves doing exactly that, like digging into those frameworks. That's how he uh, dug into Hibernate. He's like one of the lar like pretty large Hibernate contributor. And this, this is how he learns a lot by actually digging through how things are implemented under the covers and, and doing that. And the fun thing is, get your hands dirty. The worst thing that can happen is that you learn something new. It's, it's the same with building things. Should you build a dependency injection framework? Hell yes! Should you use it? Maybe not. But build one. See what happens. See what it takes to do those things. All right. Here's another nice graph. What could that graph be? Any, any ideas what that could be? For the people with glasses in the back, that's two and a half thousand. Go 
good one. If you have an open source project, there are many people coming from the outside with ideas. Those ideas are all good, but the more ideas, the more clash you have because different stakeholders might have conflicting ideas. All of the ideas are good, but they're conflicting with each other. And so um, the graph I've shown you, you got it right. It's issues. It's the open number of issues in the Cradle project. Does it mean Gradle is bad? Not at all. It just means there, over the years, stuff accumulated, and the team couldn't, didn't have the bandwidth to take care all, of all of that, being triaging it, looking at it. And so at one point, they decided to, to actually like, cut it and stop the whole thing. So they introduced like, a bot to mark things as stale with the very explicit explanation that it's not that it's invalid, it's not that this bug is fixed, it's just we, had, we didn't have the bandwidth to look at it. And this is another part of like, running such a large project, even internally or as open source, that so many outside contributors try to shift the project in a direction and you have to somehow figure out how to do that. And that's something that's really hard and um, something you have to be also very, very kind with open source maintainers. So rather than commenting on that issue for the 40th time, hey, when is this fixed? Try and push a potential fix because that might help the maintainer to find the energy to actually push it through and help you with that instead, in, instead of like just pay, piling on top of, of the existing things. Uh, which brings me to Lila. She's a project security engineer at GitHub. And I loved her story because she was not in tech uh, two years ago. Then she started with open source and actually met a lot of people there, contributed to her first open source projects while learning to program. And as part of that, she, she met a lot of hubbers and uh, this all led in the end to her joining GitHub a year later. Uh, I found her story very inspiring. So, code is not the only option how you can help open source projects. You can actually help them by taking away work from them, by helping them triage issues, by helping them get their stuff in line so the maintainers can actually write some code sometimes. Uh, so that's something that a lot of maintainers actually love to see. Best thing is, talk with them. What has worked in the past, what didn't work. It's something I regularly use in my, in, in my work projects. Like the th the way we ran open source projects is also something where I learned stuff how to run my projects uh, internally. And that is something that Benjamin here uh, is also very proud of. Like uh, back in the days, he was also uh, contributing a lot to the RT RCP platform. Uh, nowadays, he's a principal software engineer at Microsoft working mostly on VS Code. And when he was at uh, working on Eclipse, he was also doing RSSO, which is an RSS reader based on RCP. And this is where he draw his energy from, from the community around the world, helping him to run this project. Like one, something he fixed for himself got bigger and bigger and he had like a worldwide community of, of developers helping him. So yeah, that's my key lesson here, help maintainers by creating space for their own contributions. Let's talk about sponsoring. Has anyone ever sponsored an open source developer? It's all right. I can show you ways to do that. You can use GitHub sponsors. Um, but even better, you can use programs like Google Summer of Code. Um, so there, like, there are direct sponsoring opportunities uh, where you can sponsor a project or a person. There are also those indirect uh, ways. Uh, Google Summer of Code, for example, is a program where uh, an open source project like Eclipse says, we are an open source project, we need help. And Google, every summer, they offer to like, a number of students to cover their expenses um, to work on open source for full time for three months. So um, student works on open source, Google pays them, I don't know, three or five K, I don't know what the numbers are these days. Uh, but it's significant, and it's, it's a lot of help. Like, I've, I've done it myself a few times during university years. I met lots of people doing that as well. And people like Patience here. Uh, she's a senior engineer at Octopus Energy no nowadays. And back in the days, she was also doing Google Summer of Code, and uh, 
when she, <laughs> with the tweet, moved continents uh, recently, her mentor from back then actually helped her to land a job uh, in her target destination because things didn't work out as she wanted to. And th that was an awesome story. And like, you see, even over 10 years, your, your Google sum of code mentor was still like a connection she had there. Another way to sponsor people is not by using money, but by actually using your own con connections to promote people. So, have you tried applying to speak at conferences or meetups already? That's, you try to help people. Rather go, I recommended you for this speaking gig. Can you do it? Really get people on, on the line, get people into those positions where they can accept those, um, those sponsorships. So, um, that's actually like something that I highly recommend to everybody. Uh, from Lara Hogan, her, her um, blog post about sponsorship there and how it can help foster a team culture. And that also happens, for example, with Trisha and Kevlin. Uh, they decided to write a book, 97 Things Every Java Programmer Should Know, and proactively reached out to potential authors saying, hey, uh, we recommend you for this book, can you help us? And it's like, this is an opportunity for a lot of Java developers to actually contribute to a book without, like, writing a, a whole book yourself. And this is my final story. I still, I'm still in awe by this story. It all started in an IRC chat at Eclipse, um, in, the, in the free node Eclipse IRC channels. I used to hang out there because there, this is where all the cool kids were and where people actually answered my questions around Eclipse. And then there was this moment where Eclipse Con, Eclipse Con in uh, San Francisco was coming up. And me, as a student, I was like, okay, means I'm, I'll be in that IRC channel by myself for the next two weeks. And there was this one guy called Philip Ombredan who actually talked to the Eclipse Foundation staff and he said, hey, how about Benny does our live IRC reporting for EclipseCon? And he gets a free ticket for that. And using his connections, he got me into EclipseCon. I had to pay the flight and everything myself. But I had the opportunity to go to an Eclipse Con where those cool people hang out these days. And it actually, I made so many friends there and that was the start of being part of a community for over 10 years. It's like I can never pay that back and no money could have changed anything with that. So I'm very grateful for him to, to pull that one off. Um, it was there in Santa Clara, that was cool. Only a half a year or only a year later, I actually did my first talk at an Eclipse Con, which was actually here at the Burger Saal, uh, right above. And that is one of the fi final key lessons I have, pay it forward. Help other people to go their way, help other people to, to do the right thing and to promote your open source project. And help, other, like, help your open source projects uh, in any way you can, you can do. So key takeaways we have. Learn, use open source as a learning platform. Use it to hone your own skills, to learn about the new technologies that you might not use yet at your, at your company, but that can actually be leveraged quite well at your company. Make your work visible, because whatever you contribute is visible to the outside world. All the recent jobs I submitted uh, my CVs to, usually had open source contributions because most of the stuff I do at work, I can't talk about. Get your hands dirty, try stuff out. Try to break it, try to see what tests fail. And even if you just navigate around the code base, it actually helps you to learn about how things work in other code bases. And pay it forward. Go out there, help other projects to, like promote other projects, help other developers, uplift others. To, to do that. And with that, I'm coming to close uh, with a final tweet. Opening a back report with a snippet to reproduce took me 10 minutes. Writing a patch for that, two hours. Getting pinged on that thing 11 years later, whether I can wrap up that patch, it was priceless. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, 
since you're working on um, the copilot, uh, yeah. do you think it's stealing um, code from other code bases? <laughs> Not going to answer that. <laughs> There is a long answer we can talk about, um, but there is no short, short answer to that. Other questions? Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, about contributing and uh, as an example, uh, doing some triage uh, on the issues. Uh, so that look, that sounds like a good idea, but then uh, you really need to know the, how the team works and so on to do the good triage. So I do have the feeling it's not that easy. So what would be the, the recommended way of doing it? Um, because if you spend, say, one hour with people uh, trying to understand how they work, uh, you really have to do some triage to get that hour back for, for them. Yeah, that's a great question. How to do triaging for open source projects or teams you don't know. Uh, so one aspect is talk to the teams. Very likely they don't have a triage process yet. So they actually don't care how it gets done as long as somebody does it. The other thing is it depends on what you triage and how. So for example, do you put it into buckets of, oh, these things are related to this? Or do you just take a few defects and say, this is still a defect, I rep like I reproduced that in the most recent version. At Gradle, for example, we had the problem that there were bugs that were five, six years old. They looked valid, but are they still valid? Because the code base evolved over six years. And so even trying to figure out is this still a problem or not, that was essential. And from like the stablebot over some time, it closed, I think, over two and a half thousand issues because like they kept creeping up, so we actually closed a lot of them. I think three or four percent got reopened because there were simply no, not problems anymore. And, but even figuring that out takes so much time. So um, a, valid, like a valuable community contribution is verifying this is still a problem or attaching a reproducer. Most bug reports come without a reproducer. So attaching that is like super valuable as a maintainer to say, oh, this is reproducible. I can take that, put it in my test case and know what's, and it's way easier from there. So thanks for the question. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, let's wrap it up here. Thanks, everyone.